Hello, everybody. Welcome to We'll See You in Hell, the podcast brought to you by the Fangoria Podcast Network, the newly formed Fangoria Podcast Network. For more information about this network, including other programs and how to follow our show and find all the past episodes of our show and the other shows, because there's a bunch of shows, just go visit Fangoria.com, please. To my left, Patty Walsh in full beautiful stereo. Hey, guys. It's good to see you again. We haven't done this in a very long time, Joe. I know we just released one a couple weeks back, but it's probably been a good month since you and I have hoisted the old mics to our lips. I'll tell you, it's been hard to stay away with this riveting energy you bring to the table. Oh, shut the fuck up. (laughs) Uh, Joe and I were in a furious text battle on the way over here. (laughs) I write, he writes, when are you going to be here? I'm thinking about jumping in the shower. Three minutes before I'm supposed to arrive. Like you, you couldn't think of this earlier. Sometimes you're late. Not tonight, baby. I well, that, and so I go. Yeah. I'm I'm rolling down sunset, and it corrects it to subset. The, like the, the spell stupid check. autocorrect. Does. Yeah. Joe goes. What the fuck is subset? That's not a street name. I was joking. And while he does it, he says "fuck you," and it comes out "fuck your." And then, boy, <laughs> I my dick became so hard because while he's chewing me out for an autocorrect error. He hits me back with one of his own. And then, folks, he pretended he tried to do it. I know. I did try to pass it off that I was doing a bit. But I, I, knew was, rel- but I, know I was you joking too well. about I know su- you too well, baby. You know I'm not I'm not sharp enough to make a j- <laughs> joke that quickly. I did. I knew you weren't smart enough or funny enough. <laughs> and I jumped all over it. So then at 8 o'clock sharp, I pull up. I go, you know, he goes, come on in. I go, your dog's going to go nuts. He goes nuts even when Joe opens well, the you, door. You're for leaving it. How are you a writer for television? The details you're leaving out. What am he I goes, leaving? He goes, "Come on in." I was indisposed, and I said, "Just let yourself in." And then right. you oh, said, "I left out." He's in the shower. Folks. Yeah, I didn't want to get you too aroused. Well, look, the reason uh, I'm giving you shit, uh, probably, and it's got to do with our topic for today, sloth. Yeah. Uh, this this podcast it's it's a it's a goddamn fucking burden and i've said it before and i'll say it again whenever you're coming over to do this i'm never looking forward to it i'm oh. not excited about it oh i'm excited to see you yeah i'm excited that people for some reason want to hear us talk to one another but There's i mean something about the the phrase have to do like we have to do a pocket because we do got to meet a deadline whatever else when I hear that have to do, I shut down so hard. And it's the loosest deadline. I mean, the folks at Fangoria, yeah, as you'd imagine, be nicer. They're, not, they're not corporate. No. <laughs> they're not corporate, you know, uh, ty- tyrants. So they, they, you know, this is a very pretty open-minded, laid-back crew we got over there. I mean, I've never been to the Fangoria offices, but I'd imagine, you know, there's a lot of, like, uh, Halloween party-style cobwebs, a lot of fake spiders. <laughs> Maybe a big bubbling cauldron yeah, of fruit I, punch. I always pictured a sort of a Pee Wee Herman style yeah. decorative thing. There's maybe a talking, frightening chair. and A and, bowl of grapes that they tell you is eyeballs. Yeah. And then a stuffed dummy in the corner with one of those rubber Halloween masks on it. When you walk by, it goes, woo, hoo, hoo, hoo. Yeah, sure. You sure. know what I mean? We did a Halloween party when I was a kid, and I turned my entire basement into a haunted house. It was incredible. Yeah. And at the end, my mom we hid in our giant freezer, and she popped up like a, a living corpse out of this freezer. We cleared all the chicken fingers and shit out of it. Uh, it was truly horrifying. Like, all my friends were like, you don't expect that. It was a lot of like, oh, here's brains, and it was spaghetti. And, like, you know, kids are 10. Like, ew, gross. And then at the end, when my mom comes flying out of this fucking. You had one of those floor freezer yeah. things with the, t- with the, the you yeah. open it from the top. Boy, people went fucking nuts. Now, you turned the freezer off before she got in there, I assume. No, she passed away. Uh, she was frostbit. <laughs> that was what scared them. I, I opened it like mom, and then they to like be face-to-face with a corpse. This is a dark joke. This is <laughs> My mom is alive and well, and I love her very much, folks. Uh, I'll tell you another thing that annoys me about this podcast. Look at our levels. Now, we're, right now, we st- we're staring at a sc- computer screen that shows our levels as we record. Look how much lower than me you are. Well, I'm not every sp- week I, I readjust this, so I have to, so I don't have to adjust it again. And then every week we do this, and then it's you're too low again. I don't understand what is happening. Well, maybe it's that I talk normally and you scream like a damn banshee. Well, it, Pat, I'm not a happy man. No, I know. And it's been stated on here before, and I'll say it again. Yeah, 
I'm not a happy man. We uh, live in a cesspool. <laughs> uh, we're talking today, folks, about Sloth. Sloth. The podcast, if you've been away for a few weeks, has a new format, and it's about sin. Each week's a different sin. It's a loose framework for us to discuss you know, what's going on in our lives, movies, etc. This week's about Sloth, easily the most horrifying to me in the film 7. Speaking of things jolting awake that you thought were dead, that really fucked me up. That was yeah. probably the scariest scene I've ever seen in a movie. I'll tell you what my experience was with that scene. I My friend Jerry had seen the movie before I did, and yeah. he was with me when I saw it the first time. And the entire movie leading up to that, he kept like hauntingly war like warning me out of his own tension because he didn't want to see the scene again yeah how bad this sloth scene was going to be and i will tell you it delivered on all counts it's insane you almost can't set it up too much i saw it a buddy of mine and i snuck in well we went we bought a ticket for some pg movie and then snuck into seven and i had not seen many r-rated movies at this time i was i think i was like 14 or something and that scene fucked me up in a really severe way then later on my dad decided as i was getting older to start letting me see the occasional r-rated movie seven he thought was fine there couldn't be any nudity in seven cut to yeah. a 10 minute sequence of a guy talking about being forced to fuck a woman with a knife <laughs> but you uh, didn't see it as the point right which was probably better to him than me seeing a yeah. nipple for christ's sake well that's how all those parents thought back then yeah yeah but uh as that scene's coming up i'm telling myself okay you can't let on to I can't let on to my dad that I know this scene is coming. I can't. I have to be just as scared this time out. You know, sure. I was I was thinking I was going to have to make myself jump to prove that I hadn't yeah. seen it. Because that would look believable. Yeah. Yeah. Then, you know, of course, just watching the scene a second time made me shit my pants all over again. I didn't have to act. Yeah, it's uh, that's a rough one. Speaking of shit. Yeah. That's why I had to get in the shower. Oh, Joe. I was getting ready to do the pod here. I was setting up the mics and everything, and I had a feeling come over me, man. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I could have I could have fertilized the Serengeti with what I did in that toilet. <sighs> For years, baby. I don't I don't love this years humor. It was a real mess in there. And I had to get a shower, so I apologize. It's all right. I what, apologize. Now what happens if you if you do that at work? I've never like taken a shit where I was like, I need to get a get a shower. <laughs> What are people doing? I mean, I could have gotten by without a shower, but yeah. I felt better getting a shower. We're going to go out on the town after this tonight, as we yeah. often do after our cast. Sure, you got to celebrate another slam dunk. Yeah, and I, I just said I want to be fresh. Yeah. I want to be fresh for the ladies that you know, you know. We're talking about going to that salsa club that we that just opened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, I, I got brought my best cummerbund now. Before we get into sloth, I know we're kind of circling here. Well, actually, this is, relates to sloth. One of the things you and I both do as two lazy men is watch a lot of movies. Yeah. Because it doesn't take a lot of effort. doesn't take a lot of activity. You kind of lay there. You watch. I mentioned Pee Wee Herman earlier. I got to talk about this. I mean, I think it was supposed to be a movie. That new oh, Pee Wee boy. thing is holy shit. Well, and I respect Paul Rubens. I'm not shitting on the guy. I respect the people involved with the film. Uh, but, I mean, my God almighty, I couldn't. I, it was one of the n most not funny things I've seen in a long time. And they added this whole dark. Well, why, why did they make Pee Wee sort of like sinister all of a sudden and like really selfish and shitty? And yeah, there's that running gag through the movie where it goes, I'm going to let you let me go now. Like where he's like really mean to everybody. And yeah. I'm like, what, what, what is this? And then uh, he kind of look like look, look, looks like he wants to fuck the guy from Magic Mike a little bit through the whole thing, which that's fine. Right. But like, it's just it's like all these you're throwing me too many Pee Wee curveballs right now. I don't know what to, what I don't understand what the it was a lot. I loved that wink where Manganiello is like, well, have you seen this? This have you seen Magic Mike? And he goes, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Thought that was funny. But I'm like, so you're basically hinting now that Pee Wee is a closeted gay man or something, which was never really in there before. Well, because it's... I, he was a child. I, I guess the the old stage show was more adult. I don't want Pee Wee being sexual in any way. Yeah. At all. Agreed. I, okay, it bothered me on the TV show when when Miss Miss Yvonne. Elaine, uh, Miss Yvonne, yeah. f was holding the dumbbell and she fell down with it and it the bar bent to the shape of her tits. 
Sure. I didn't like that. Right. Even as a corny kid, I didn't like that. Well, it's, in don't mix Big sex Adventure in with this. and so forth, when women come on to him, he's he's extremely uncomfortable. And you don't know if it's because he's asexual or, or gay or what. He's but a really, child. It's that he's a 10-year-old boy, I think, is supposed to be the takeaway. Well, in the first movie, that, that, that hot piece of prosciutto... Uh, Dottie is trying to bone him, and he's yeah. he like is like making a mockery of her for exactly. being I- in romantically interested. And it was hilarious. Suddenly, in this one, they got that whole thing where he's making Joe Montaigne. What the fuck's the guy's Man-Janella. name? Manganella. He's making him a milkshake. Yeah. I mean, is that enough of a metaphor for you? Yeah. I gotta pump the milk. He's literally like pumping uh, vanilla. Yeah. Into the f- come on, man. <laughs> well, look, I saw it probably. Six months ago, I have not seen the final new version. That's where'd on you Netflix. see it? I saw it uh, with our friend Pete and Apatow and his wife. So you saw this with Pete Holmes, yeah, our friend Judd Apatow, who produced the film, right? Who Pete is also working with, as am I. And uh, and you're writing on that show now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you this has been a long having to pretend you liked something, <laughs> hasn't it? So you've really trapped me. But when I saw it, uh, as I said then, I don't know what changes they made, but I was like, for, I thought the opening scene with the alien was hilarious. I love the alien's voice. And then throughout, yeah, it was no big adventure. I thought it was on a par with like a Big Top Pee Wee. No, it, it was worse than Big Top Pee Wee, which was, I was astounding told, to me. I saw it no music and was told the music would help out greatly. And I also, here's a fun fact for you, when I saw it, Paul Rubens came out and talked, and he's about 60, and, you know, he looked like a, a fit, vital 60 years old. But he had a, in the film, every scene, he had a clamp attached to the back of his neck, pulling his entire face skin back. And he was like, you're going to see this weird clamp on my neck. We're digitally removing it in post. So every scene when I'm trying to watch and enjoy this movie, his face is being held back with a metal clamp. So it was very jarring and difficult to enjoy, and I have not seen the final product. Uh, but I'll tell you, I think you saw a better version. <laughs> I All mean, right. I would have appreciated a, a clamp or something, something, just something to keep me <laughs> interested. Did you watch the whole thing? I tried, man. I tried several times, and I cr- I picked up where I left off, and I, I couldn't get through it, man. It's 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 not. He's also I hate to say this, he's not nailing the Pee Wee character. It's not there. Like it's it sounds too much like he's just talking in this Paul Rubens voice. There's not enough of the like Well, he's sixty. Well, but there's not enough of that roller coaster in the pitch and look, Martin sure. Short is sixty. Yeah, that's you true. You see him do Jiminy Glick, it's fucking up and down the, the octave. You that's know? True. Like the the but and I, I I watched it wanting to love and I also worked on Pete's show before you did. Yep. And got to work with Mr. Apatel, who was was very nice and we had a nice time and I was excited to see it. I wanted to, to really like this. But I also feel like he's the kind of guy where you could say, like, nah, I didn't like that, and he wouldn't be, like, offended by it. Yeah, I think so. I That's mean, why I don't feel weird. I win it. Pee-wee's Big Adventure is a, is a top 20 for me. I've seen it a thousand times when I was a kid. And I saw a, a real temp version. I, I'm not even prepared to comment on it. But I... Well played, Patty. Well played. This I'm... guy knows how to work this town. <laughs> uh... Not shitting on the talents of anybody involved. I just did no. not care for the film. And in fact, they did do a sex thing in Big Top Pee Wee, and that bothered me too. When he bangs that Italian chick from 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 Hot Shots. Well, and he, Rain I remember Man. a makeout scene. Do they fuck? They make out, and then it cuts to a montage of a train going through a yeah, tunnel yeah. and a volcano exploding. Yeah, which they also did in Top Secret and many other movies. I mean, get that out of my Pee Wee movie. I, I do agree with that. It's too much. But the old stage show was really racy as well. Maybe they're trying to get back to it that. It was like wink to the camera racy. It yeah. wasn't, we're going to show a, a volcano exploding to represent jizz. Valid point. A man-child's jizz. Which, by the way, if you met Pee Wee Herman in real life, you'd be like, this man has a, it would be illegal to fuck him. He would, ha- you would, sure. he would be a retarded man. Sure. He, you know, you know, he would have a mental condition of some kind. They were, you know, so you couldn't bang the guy. If you were, you know, so inclined. Well, Should yeah, we... unless you were of that. I, I'm, I'm afraid ha- of the more I explain this, I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I think I it's do. illegal to have sex with a retarded person is what oh. I'm trying to get at. Yeah, it is. Although I shared this story today at work to great acclaim and I'll share it now. It's very brief. When I was in high school, I worked the Special Olympics. 
Just for the just for the chicks. Didn't compete. I worked at the Special <laughs> Olympics. And I was assigned a very sweet young girl with Down syndrome. And she's in a sweatsuit and she's competing in all the events. Mm. And I'm talking to my buddy Ryan. And all of a sudden, he steps back and he goes, Pat, 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 Pat. I'm like, what? I look down and this girl who was probably 12 years old, 13, has pulled down both her pants and underpants, mm-hmm. revealing a large black bush, <laughs> and is rubbing it. Oh, boy. She advances on me and starts rubbing it on my leg. Oh, boy. And How I th- old are you at this point? I'm probably a senior in high school, and this girl was 13 or so. Okay, so I you're th- just you're just young enough that you can go with it. <laughs> <laughs> I threw my hands in the air. Right. I waved them around like I, I did care. <laughs> I throw my hands in the air and I'm like, I go, help, 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 help. And I'm screaming for any adult. And I go, Ryan, go get somebody. Please go get somebody. So he's looking around and I was so terrified because I'm like, if the wrong person looks over here and thinks I had anything to do with this, I'm fucked. And this woman comes over and kind of pulls the girl off me and pulls her pants up. And I'm like, you you have to understand. I was talking to my friend. I, I'm, I'm stuttering and stammering. And she goes, they're very sexual. <laughs> It's okay. They're very sexual. But I was deeply traumatized. And I had sort of repressed the memory till yesterday at work. An opportunity arose to tell this tale. Right. Yeah. Well, this is what your response should have been when she went, it's okay. You should have went, for her, maybe. <laughs> yeah. That should have been your I'm response. Violated. Now, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to even bring up Batman v Superman. Do we do that at another podcast? Because I, I feel like you probably want to scream about this for 20 minutes. I mean, I've said all I needed to say on Twitter. It's a fantastic movie. It's the best Batman ever. It's the it's 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 Gene Hackman level Lex Luthor. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm just gonna sit back and it's let an you interesting sign in, your death. It's warrant. an interesting interpretation of Superman, which is from pulled straight from the comics. Same with Batman. Um, and it was a fine piece of work. I, I really enjoyed the movie. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It certainly does not deserve a 29% on Rotten Tomatoes. No, it deserves a 9%. Oh, stop it. It, it. There was no humor. There was no humor in the other Batman movies. There was no fun in the other Batman movies. I don't need humor in my movies. There's a great deal of humor and fun in Batman and Batman Returns. There's way too much in the other two Schumacher There's joints. no humor in Batman 1. I think Tim there's Burton plenty. One. Nicholson is... Definitely bring humor. Let's to talk the Nolan ones, which were critically acclaimed. Now, those did, did not have humor, but I thought they were. I mean, the, the Dark Knight, everyone loves the Dark I don't know why you wouldn't love the I Dark love Knight. the Dark Knight. I love the Nolan trilogy. But for people to say this wasn't as good and far worse because it didn't have humor and it wasn't That's fun. I'm saying it's a dark film. It's called a grown ups comic book movie. But I also thought it wasn't exciting or cool to look at. Oh, I thought it was beautifully shot. Or. I, I didn't care from one minute to the next what happened. It was a frame by frame graphic novel. It was beautiful. There were there were there were panels recreated right out of the Dark Knight Returns. Well, see, I'd never read that. Um, no there were. I love that it was Super Death of Superman. I love that it was Batman Returns, two of my favorite comics of all time, or Dark Knight Returns, two of my favorite comics of all time. I love that Doomsday was in it. Lex Luthor. It was a brilliant. Brilliant, especially with the with the emergence of Martin Shkreli and those types of guys. It was a brilliant interpretation. Uh, pitch you liked perfect. Eisenberg. I thought he was fantastic, and I and it made total sense. Of course, that's what that guy would be now. He'd be an upstart guy, and even down to the fact. This is how well written that part was. Even down to the fact. When they talk about Lex, the name LexCorp, and they go, well, it's nice to meet the Lex in front of the corp. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. My father named the company. That's his Lex in front of the corp. It's, that is such a brilliant piece of writing because, of course, if that guy started the company, young Lex Luthor, it'd be called like Spibo or something like, you know what I mean? Some modern thing. And it's like, well, how do we still keep it named LexCorp but make him a sort of Facebook guy? Oh, well, we'll say his dad named the company and his dad started it and he inherited it. And he's now this like he's now this like cutting edge, technological, tech savvy fucking, you know, what's I mean, his face? The few the very few people I've talked to that thought the movie was OK, because I haven't heard anyone. But you think it was better than OK. I thought it was brilliant. And I'm not exaggerating. Um, 
everyone, including those people, despised Eisenberg. Oh, well, then everybody must be right. I I mean, if everyone thinks something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right, but it means they might be on to something. You're the only person I know that didn't like the witch, and you refused no, to I see the, the general the perspective on that. Didn't love the witch. And I know lots of people who were very bored by the witch, you including told me the guy you, I went with. You told me you didn't like it. You used those words. Yeah, you know, it... I, I, I liked the tone, and I liked what it was kind of going for. I liked it way more than the guy I went with, and I know many people who didn't. You thought 10 Cloverfield Lane was better than The Witch, which, if for anybody listening... Significantly. For anybody listening, now you know what I'm dealing with over here. But, Joe, you're preaching to people who vehemently disagree with you. No, people don't like Batman versus Superman. I guarantee you the Fangoria audience does not disagree with me on The Witch... And perhaps the witch. I'd be willing to bet they're a hell of a lot more open minded about Batman versus Superman than you are. All right. But I, what the hell do you know about comic? Are you a comic book guy? No, not at all. Well, that's why you didn't. It was a movie for comic book but fans. But this is a world full Don't these give days a shit. of huge comic book fans. And they all, didn't love the Guess movie. what? Every single huge comic book fan I know said it was phenomenal. Every single one. I find that very hard to believe. Every single one. It, Are you with in the exception, a I love Batman versus Superman chat room? With the exception of one Andy Levy from Fox News' Red Eye. I know Andy Levy. And when I talked to Andy on the phone about it, I could slowly hear him coming around and going, oh, okay, well, I didn't think about it like that. But they had elements of Flashpoint Paradox in there. Dude, it was fucking amazing. I don't know what that means. But well, th And that's why you didn't like it. All I can say is that I was excruciatingly bored from the first minute to the last and that's all i have to say because that's my opinion of the movie that's if fine. i'm bored i can't change it that's fine i started to doze during the fight the villain was a large turd that couldn't speak oh other than eisenberg and doomsday they're all just kind of throwing each other into things doomsday is made from kryptonian dna i'm talking as far as when i when i'm looking at the screen he kills superman i'm seeing a turd throw around two guys I don't because care about. you don't get it because it starts as a sort of amorphous thing and then slowly as he powers up his bones start popping out and he becomes the doomsday from the comic books there was it was great I just I couldn't I love the sequence with anything. the flash I love the little Aquaman thing I love the Wonder Woman stuff I thought it was phenomenal are we getting whole like a whole movie with that that dude as Aquaman and that dude as the Flash. These are all going to happen. The Flash will happen after Justice League. Aquaman and Wonder Woman and the solo Batman movie are coming, I believe, after Suicide Squad. When I think of the 60 interesting $10 million movies that I'm not going to see because of all this horse shit coming out, it makes me so depressed. I don't want to get out of bed if I think about it too much. Well, there's back to our theme. When I think Sloth. about the, the 300 $1 million interesting indie movies that I'm missing to, to watch oh, this pile of sakes. garbage. Shut a up. turd, throw two people I don't care about around. I love, I, by the way, I love this. You were bored by it. This guy was glued to the screen, 10 Cloverfield Lane. It's three people playing cards for 90 minutes. <laughs> You like 10 Cloverfield I'm not saying Lane. I didn't like it, but I'm just saying, like, you want to talk about, like, nothing's happening. All I can do is say what I liked and what I didn't like. And then also, by the way, we're going to be spoiling these films right now. By the way, also, uh, you want to talk about, you get to the end of the goddamn movie, and it's like, oh, it's exactly what it was supposed to be the whole time? Well, we already talked about 10 John Go Lane. Goodman's evil, and, and it's aliens. It's, it's literally exactly what, there's no twist. We already talked about this. We shouldn't go back to it. We're on Batman versus Superman. But I thought it was insanely boring. I don't know why every movie has to be 240. I, don't I can't get wait it. for the three-hour R-rated Blu-ray. I'm buying it the day it comes out. You're watching that all alone. I don't need you in my life, <laughs> nor want I you. I will not be there. Good. Speaking I wish I was alone now. As do I, Joe. Now I'm starting to think maybe the podcast direction we should go in, maybe it's not about sin. Maybe it's us doing like a Siskel and Ebert movie debate That's podcast. what it always was. Maybe we need to get back to that. And every you week... You can't change the format every three weeks. Do whatever the fuck we want. It's free. It fuck free. these people. It's free and we don't make a, <laughs> we don't make a dime. And it's free. Every time I'm coming over here, like Joe asked me to do this podcast, I was like, yeah, sure. Then I'm like, why am I doing this? But it is fun and I like to see the feedback. I think this is the birth of the new format. I, you know, it's nice to get yelled at by Joe on a microphone as opposed to just face to face. I think this is the birth of the new format. It's we'll see you in hell. 
but you don't see all the movies. Like I've seen a lot it's, of movies. Hold in on the past a second. Two weeks. Can I finish my thought, maybe, before you say yours? <laughs> How about I finish my thought? How about I finish my thought? Joe, if I let you finish your thought, this podcast would be me nodding silently while you scream. Oh! Your thought is always in in progress. Sometimes I got to go, eh, but... Uh. <laughs> Was that... I have something to say now. That's not, are you doing Dice Clay's kind woman of. voice? When are we going to watch that Dice show? That's something we can talk about on the podcast I Next heard time. the Adrian Brody episode is a grand slam. Well, I certainly hate Adrian Brody, but I'm I'm excited to see the, the episode show. is Dice teaching him to how to be a man, and yeah. Adrian B- Brody starts just impersonating Dice. Yeah, and apparently his Dice impression is like off the fucking chain. All right, I'll see it. But can I finish about the podcast? Finish, finish. Every week, we discuss a film or films that fall under the Fangoria umbrella doesn't have to necessarily be horror it could be sci-fi it could be fantasy okay yeah uh that we agree or disagree on and we have a siskel and ebert kind of debate about them i think that's fine we've had this format for three weeks yeah that's well nuts, maybe we Joe. get through the sins the it's like seven you get sins. a new car every two weeks we'll get through the seven sins and then we'll switch season three for all okay. intents and purposes, like will be that, okay? I respect that. Because I believe this is now season two of the podcast. That's how I look at it. All right. I've seen a lot of movies since last we talked, but I don't think you've seen any of them. So that's why the Cisco Neighbor But it's fine, but my point is, is I can go to the shelf over here and I could say, Patty, The Vanishing, let's go. Oh, wait, you want to watch old movies? No, I'm not saying watch. I'm saying discuss. No, but I mean, you want to discuss old movies and not movies in the theater? Because that's not Cisco Neighbor at all. Well, we can do both. It doesn't matter. Okay, why don't we go see a movie or two together each week and talk about it? Oh, yeah, because this isn't a burden enough. (laughs) Uh, Wouldn't it be rough to see a movie with a friend? Listen, remember when we were were killing two birds with one stone and watching the movie while doing the podcast? That was too much. Now you want to see a movie separately, then do a podcast about it. I I remember. We do go to the movies at least once a month. My point is is we could discuss. You know, here's a movie I'd love to discuss. We're not getting into it right now. Okay. But in the future, I want to talk about Blade Runner. The movie bores me to piss. I can't get through the fucking thing. I Well, I completely agree, so that'll well, be a boring episode. It wouldn't be a boring episode, because yeah. I would love for us to talk about why we don't like it. And I've tried, okay, here's the cut without the Harrison Ford narration. Here's the cut with the narration. Here's the cut without the unicorn. Here's the cut with no unicorn. Two unicorns. No Daryl Hannah. Four Daryl Hannahs. They, there's 8,000 cuts of this movie, and none of them are good. I can't. It, it, the, let's save it. All right. Because the movie makes no sense, and I have great arguments for that, I think. All right. I was really going off. Pat and I went on an apartment crawl last Saturday where many of our friends had a specialty drink at their apartments, and then you'd go apartment to apartment, have a couple drinks, go to the next place. Yeah. Very fun. Uh, but, I mean, when we were in the depths of that thing, and, I mean, it got dark, people. <laughs> Come 6 p.m. We started at 12. Come 6 it p.m. Did. We were real down in it at that point. When we hit that last bar, people were, like, walking off on their own, bumping into walls. and Yeah. It, it got was, real ugly. And it went people, through about I, 10 p.m. I over at some point. I saw Kurt muttering to himself in a corner. Yeah, it was... It was... <laughs> it was a real long haul. Yeah. But I remember... Somewhere around the 7 p.m. mark going off about Blade Runner. And whoever I was doing it to did not like it. <laughs> well, I thought that was here on the Friday night prior. But maybe you did it you know two what? days in a I'm row. I'm not going to lie to you, Pat. The Friday night before the, pub, the uh, apartment crawl, I was pretty out of my fucking mind that night, too. <laughs> because I got a new game. I downloaded a game on PS4 from the network called uh, Zombie. Zombie. And eh? And, and I was excited to play it for the first time last night, and yeah. I turned it on, and I apparently had put a good 35 minutes into the game Okay, on that Friday night that we yeah, had no, you no were, recollection. You were ranting and raving about Blade Runner that night as well. Well, then that's what it was. Okay. Uh, you know, we ate those weed gummies and smoked a bunch of weed and drank a ton. And that was a hell of a night, though. We spun yeah, all those I records. Fun. I feel like I've been working hard, and to bring it back to Sloth, which we have to do for at least a few minutes. I feel like I've been working hard for a long, long time. I usually have a long hiatus. I went from one job to another. I'm tired. I'm mentally exhausted. And when the weekend comes, it's the freaking weekend, baby. I'm about to have me some fun. 
Well, tonight's my Friday. It's Thursday right now, but I switched my Friday off. I switched my Sunday off for Friday this week because we have to shoot on Sunday. Yeah, with the show I'm writing for, and uh, so now I have Friday and Saturday off of this week. Okay. So tonight's my Friday. We're going and out. Tomorrow's my Saturday. Yeah. And Saturday might be my Saturday again, <laughs> even though I got to work and on Sunday. Sunday might be my Saturday too. And yeah. Then Monday could possibly be my Saturday. Monday's my Thursday. That's a hard rule that I don't change. But now, see, we are talking sloth. Sloth essentially means laziness, and it's not good to be lazy. You know, in the grand scheme of things, Joe, you and I are not lazy men. We're just not. We're hard workers. We're always working. We're always making money. But is that sloth? The, what I, or is that the opposite of sloth? I mean, we work to survive. We work to fulfill our dreams. But I'll tell you something, man. I mean, we're going to go out tonight. We're going to have some drinks. We're going to have some laughs. Maybe a little reef. Who the hell That's knows? Gluttony. That's not sloth. But hold on a second. Let me finish the thought, Pat. You know, in a podcast, there has to be a give and take. There is. And you just gave, and now I'm taking. <laughs> Let me finish the sentence. <laughs> My point Whoa. is, is we're going out for fun tonight. Yep. If you walked... It wouldn't take much for you to convince me to not get out of this chair, is my point. Oh, sure. Even with a fun night in front of me. But we do. That's the thing. I think most people, and I mean most, and especially when you're talking about the entire nation at large, are coming home from work every night at 6 o'clock, eating dinner, and then sitting on the couch and watching television until they fall asleep every single day. I don't blame them for it. I get it. But I am going out a lot or else... On the nights where I sit in and watch a movie, I used to not be this way, and I miss it sincerely. I work a ton. I'm doing what I love. But if I sit for five minutes now, and I think it's the phones, fucked up our fucking attention span. Sure. I'm sitting there going, shouldn't I be writing something? Shouldn't I be doing something? And I think that keeps me from being slothful because I can't enjoy being slothful like I used to. I used to rent six movies on a Friday night, come home at 5 p.m. and watch all six I miss that. Six movies. Yeah. So you'd go you'd go six PM to six AM. Yeah, almost every Friday night. By yourself. Uh I'd watch usually three with my dad on a Friday and maybe even a Saturday but night. This is when you're a kid, you mean? When I'm a kid. Oh, and not okay. always six, you know, four, whatever. But that was all I did. It's all I looked forward to. Um and I was so happy and so caught up in the movie. And now my brain is going every which way, and I'm not truly relaxing or being present or in the moment or whatever you want to call it. I'll tell you, one thing I do like about working a day job is that 9.30, 9.45 hits, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm gearing up for bed. Oh, sure. I'm, in, I'm under the covers by 10.15. I'm reading comic books till about 11. My eyes are closing because I'm tired from reading, and I'm out, and it's a really nice night's sleep. It's good. It's kind of what one is supposed to do, I think. And that's why I think I rebel against it. Like, I always sort of force myself to stay up till one. Well, we, you know, we've always referred to you in Hollywood, Pat, as the Zach De La Rocha. Oh, of the, absolutely. Of the TV writing world. Yeah, I, I am. I yeah. am. Um, and that's what was said to me when I first moved here. Somebody said, do you know Patty Walsh? I said, no, I don't. They said, they said if you ever want to meet the Iggy Pop of sitcoms. <laughs> I pay a guy to walk around behind me with the guitar very quietly going, because at any moment I might strike what was that word any meow meow I swear to God I thought you were doing a bit for a it's, second I was moment with a meow and it I wasn't doing a bit I just can't no, speak it just sometimes. came out wrong I yeah. thought I missed a joke is what I'm trying to say um oh by the way I got denied by uh Raya today I don't know any of those words Raya is that dating social app for like people in the biz you got denied uh, they took two weeks to get back to me. With Do they this. know you have a Comedy Central special coming out? I have a Comedy Central special coming out. I've got two behind me. I'm the vet on Better Call Saul. Yeah. I've written for multiple television shows. Yeah. I've been on Louie. I've been on Bored to Death. What the fuck do you got to do to get on Raya? Why would they deny you? Did they give you a they reason? Said, they said, listen to how fucking snotty this is. You ready right. for this? Tell people what Raya is, because I barely it's know. It's a dating social app for, for people, people in, in the, the entertainment industry. In the entertainment industry. Okay. And not that I am in any way famous, 
But you feel a little stupid. In the grand scheme of things, you are. In the grand scheme of no. America. But but you, you feel pretty stupid going on to like an okay Cupid. Yeah. And possibly running into somebody saying, "Oh, I I saw you at that show. You're a I like your com. You just feel kind of dumb." So this Raya thing is supposed to be like, "Look, man, you work putting your face out there in any way. Sure. This is for you." But all my friends are on it. I'm like, "Okay, I'm going to join it." I join it. They say we're reviewing your application. We get many applicants. Be patient. We'll get back to you. What do you have to put on this application? Your credits? Just your bullshit. Yeah. That's no, pretty- no. You just write your your info, whatever. Then they check like your Instagram or something. So anyway, weeks go by. Weeks. I'm not getting any word. I'm like, I don't know. I open the app today. It says, our board has carefully reviewed your application. Our answer is here. And there's a button that you have to press. Oh, no. Yeah. And then you press it and it says, you've been put on our waiting list after careful consideration. And it's like. That could just mean they have too many people and they're trying to seem all exclusive and shit. It's like when you go to a restaurant and you're like. Yeah, I got a table for two, and there's no one there. And they're like, let me look. Let me see if we have any space. It's to make themselves seem cool. It's Well, I know that's what it is. Yeah. And fuck you. Well, it's not necessarily a no is what I'm saying. But it's fuck you. I bet if uh, Ryan our, Gosling applies, he gets a straight Of course. Yes. Our answer is here. Oh, that's pretty fuck fucked up. Fuck you. Yeah. Fucking eat me, Raya. Why would you want to do that? You well, don't. Well, now I don't want to do it now. Is that such a big deal? You go out on an okay Cupid date, and they're like, oh, I think I saw your stand-up special. Who cares? It's an interesting job. My friend who I texted, I said, got shot down by Rhea. She said, honestly, it's a bunch of models who don't have good social skills. So right. that makes me feel better. Yeah. And it does have a model vibe, like just the layout of the app and everything. Right. You know, it's a lot of uh, fluorescent colors. I think our friend Morgan Murphy is on Rhea. Everybody's on it. She's in your same boat. You're both comedians. You're both semi-known. Everybody's on it. All right. I can't get on the fucking thing. Yeah. I got friends with no specials on it. It's they they put a lot of weight on Instagram. They say we're fo- followers. They say like we this is for people who live their lives and express themselves through Instagram. That's uh, one of the things it says. You want to you want to be in that world? No, I just want to be. I just wanted to see if it was like a good dating app. That was it. I just wanted to see. Oh, maybe I'll meet some like fun people in the business. Whatever. Right. Maybe you'll yeah. meet uh, Rebecca De Mornay, like you've been trying to will into existence. Yeah, for some that's time. what I. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I was. I had my sights set on Rebecca D. Let and then that a- hand Annie rock McDowell. your cradle. Andy McDowell lives on my street. I know. So come say hello. And she power walks around the neighborhood. She's divorced. I'm praying for the day Mary Steenburgen and Teddy D split up. Don't have, don't say that. I love the couple. I think Go they're wonderful. Go for McDowell. She's single. Why would you try to break up Hollywood sweethearts? I wouldn't try to break them up. But I'll tell you, if that Mary, if that Mary Steez ever goes solo, yeah. I mean, she is, she is dynamite. You have the, the exact same taste of women as my father, <laughs> Steenburgen, Andy McDowell. That's it. That's what was what he loves. Uh, the funniest thing Brent Sullivan has ever said to me, our good friend, who's a very funny comic, was he was telling me about his dad, and he goes, "His favorite actor is Annie McDowell," <laughs> and it was one of the funniest things I've yeah. ever heard a yeah. human being say. My dad, I may have mentioned this on this podcast before. My dad used to tell my mom when they were married that he would leave her for Andy McDowell. Now, Andy Andy McDowell is divorced, huh? I believe so. I. I've never had any particular interest in her. I, I've told my joke about her many times. I don't think she's a strong actress. Um, I love her voice. I like a southern charm. But, yeah, I, I'd take Steenburgen a thousand times over. Steen, Steenburgen is, is, could be on my list above, like, Marissa Tomei. No. I find Steenburgen to be ridiculously, ridiculously. Steenburgen to me is like another, like, Helen Tomei's. Mirren situation where it's like, She's going to be 70 and hot, smoking hot still. I think Tomei is the same way. Tomei is insane. Tomei is still getting naked. I love Tomei. Don't think I don't love Tomei. All right. Okay. Well, it's not like the beginning of Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. She's getting railed by Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's the scene that makes me never watch that movie with my parents. Yeah. Because I think my parents would really enjoy that film, but yeah. I don't want to sit through that butt fuck scene it makes you that feel it like opens maybe, on. Maybe uh, Marissa Tomei would look my way. She also went for George Costanza. Yes. You know? This is all fictional, you realize. Oh, really? I thought those were documentary. <laughs> I thought the Seinfeld show was a 99-part documentary. You know what I'm realizing as we talk about? There, there's no need for sex in these movies. There, you don't need that. 
What are you doing? You don't need that doggy style scene at the top of it before the devil knows you're dead. I don't get anything out of it. I don't get anything out of it. I get something out of the next scene where they're laying in bed going, are we that old couple and all that stuff? But I don't need a, a movie to open on naked Philip Seymour Hoffman fucking, maybe in the butt, Marissa Tomei. I think definitely not in the butt. I loved it. Why? Well, A, you got to see her naked, but it starts your movie off like, here we go. You know, like it gets your, you got to get people's attention. But it doesn't serve a purpose to me. I think that movie is awesome. You know what else? I think Hawk's great. I love that movie. Hoffman is great. I love that movie. Shannon is great. I love that movie. There's a million things in, there are a million things in that movie that could have set that movie off. Yeah. That sex scene has nothing to do with anything, as far as I'm concerned. You're talking like an old man. And I'll tell you I what. I love sex in I'll tell you, movies. when I didn't feel weird seeing Marissa Tomei naked in a movie was in The Wrestler, because she was a stripper, and it made sense. The Wrestler was so fucking great. It's great, and it made sense. I'm saying that scene doesn't make any sense to me. Why okay. do you, It could open with them in the bed. I'd be, I would have still been in. I hear you. That's all I'm saying. Open on them doing drugs together. Something. I, you know, I, I just... I didn't get it. I didn't get that scene. I'm going to do a quick... A quick sh- shuttle through of the movies I've seen because I've seen a bunch. We're talking Michael Shannon, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. I think he's an outstanding actor. I've said time and time again, one of the scariest non-horror movie scenes is Michael Shannon's scene in The Devil Knows You're Dead in that booth. Oh, absolutely. It's fucking horrifying. He's amazing in this movie called Bug that no one has seen with Ashley Judd. Yeah. Like a weird, fucked up mental horror movie. That is uh, by your boy... Uh, uh, Tracy Letts. Well, no. Uh, right? Um William Friedkin. Oh, yeah, directed it, yeah. Um, no, but I was so excited to see Midnight Special. That guy made a movie called Take Shelter with Michael Shannon. Some of the best acting I've ever seen in my life. Rent it, watch it, Take Shelter. It's amazing. And Midnight Special, I thought was going to be his jump to the big time. Folks, it's not a good movie. Didn't like it. Uh, it had a great sense of atmosphere. I was into it for like 20 minutes. And then it just started just really shit in the bed. And Kirsten Dunst and people show up and you're like, ooh, I like this person. I like this person. I'm into it. I'm it. And it just went nowhere. And then it went to a real stupid place. And it felt like a huge letdown. I thought it was going to, they all compare it to Close Encounters. Bad chance. It's not a great movie. I saw Hello, <laughs> My Name is Doris. How was that? I liked it. Uh, okay. My coworker, Miss Beth Bears. Uh, was so good in it, she won't listen to this, so I'm just saying it out from the heart. I think she should be a romantic comedy star. She's so likable. Sally Field was great in it, and I don't even like Sally Field. I worked with Michael Showalter yes. right after he completed it, Directed and I would like it. to see it. I, I, I have to say that I think it looks fine. I, the, the trailers don't particularly excite me, but I like Sally Field, and I yeah. like Michael, and I would like to see it. It's a much more interesting and kind of uncomfortable movie than you might think going in and i really enjoy well, i like that the trailers make it look a bit quirky yeah it's it's pretty intensely uncomfortable in spots i like oh it. great okay um, Well, that makes me want to see it and our buddy kumail is in it in a small role and was very funny i just saw kumail in hot tub time machine 2 and i enjoyed a funny it movie i really thought it was very yeah. funny had some great jokes in it Fuck a dude was my favorite. Yeah, when it's good. Rob Cordery when yells movie, "fuck a dude" at the game show. I mean, it was I was <laughs> beside myself. I loved it. Yeah, any movie attempting jokes, you know. And it's my buddy. Like I'm f- gonna shout. I'm gonna. We're just dropping names that no one knows left and right tonight. My buddy Josh Shield wrote uh, two, co-wrote one. The man's a super funny writer, and I thought it was super, super funny with a lot of great jokes. And it's got. Uh, it's got like a 13% or something on Rotten Tomatoes. Of course Tomatoes. it does. It's, it's, but that's what I was saying about Batman. So these these re- ratings are unfair. I never trust critics with comedies. I, I feel like these big, bloated superhero movies are all kind of the same deal to me personally, but I know you feel differently. Um, the, uh, you know, one of my favorite comedies ever is is The Watch, and it's got like an 11%. That's baffling to me, too. I thought that was okay at best. How can that be one of your favorite comedies ever? I think it's ever? hilarious. I think it's like a dirty Ghostbusters. You got Vince Vaughn. Ghostbusters, you got, you got Dan Edward getting a blowjob from a ghost. How much got, dirtier do you need it? You got Vince Vaughn, you got Jonah Hill, and you got Ben Stiller. Oh, the cast is off the damn charts. All doing the best versions of the guys they do. Jonah Hill's doing the weird, like, mama's boy, like, psycho. Vince Vaughn is doing the fast-talking 
hustler guy and Ben Stiller's doing the white bread suburban. It's like it's 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 awesome. It's a great movie. It's you really really funny. Joe, my favorite thing about you is your your passion for things. I like right now I'm like I guess I'll give the watch another try. The watch was not good, but I'm going to watch it again. I'm telling because you because I believe in your passion. It's a hilarious movie. All right, I'll try it again. Deserved better than it got. Even though I saw it pretty recently. Did we talk about Sloth at all? We're going to come back with Sloth when I'm done with the last movie I saw. Everybody Wants Some, the, quote, spiritual sequel to Days and Confused. How was it? Set in 1980. It's it a bunch good. of, like, frat boys hanging out. It's uh, it's like a Richard Linklater movie, man. It's not as good as Days and Confused or Boyhood or whatever, but it's, like, really fun. And I walked out with my buddy, and, like, neither of us had been cracking up the whole time or anything, but we were like, I would watch that again right now. He makes these movies that are just really fun hangs. Like, all these guys are frat guys. I wouldn't have probably liked them. But he makes everybody more interesting than they should be. There's beautiful, funny women in it. Everybody in it's going to be a star. And I recommend it. I thought it was a great movie. No plot at all. Really? Nothing. Nothing. There's not even, like, a big game they're trying to get to. Like, you know, Days of Confused, they pretend there's a plot. They want, they, they got to sign that uh, petition. Sure. There is nothing in this movie. Sure. And I loved it. All I, right. I, that's why I feel like that. You know, these people agonizing over story, comedy, it's not always important. Some, of course, some densely plotted comedies are fantastic. I like a comedy where you're just hanging out with funny people, sure. and they won't make those movies unless you're coming off like a Best Picture nomination. That's the only way you can get, make it. He was probably like, they can, you can do whatever you want, and he's like, yeah, I want to do this script about uh, people hanging out. It's the only way you can get something like that made. It's a shame. Yeah, I know, I know. It's uh he wanted to make a movie about sloth. Sloth, exactly. <laughs> sloth. Jackie Brown's a, you know a, a perfect hangout movie, and then when the caper starts, as as fun as and exciting as it is, you're kind of like I kind of missed that first hour where you're like getting high with Bridget Fonda in a bikini top. Jackie you know? Brown has some tremendous lines in it. It's one of my favorite movies ever. Some tremendous lines in it. I yeah. love the film. When he and fucks Bridget Fonda in the kitchen, she's like, you know, basically yeah. just says you want, and then he goes, oh, that, that hit the spot. Yeah, it's great. Genius. It's great. And then the, uh, one of the best acting choices I've literally ever seen in my life is in that movie with uh, when Samuel Jackson is talking to uh, Robert Forster yeah. to get the bail bond or whatever, and Robert Forster, he, gives, he goes, what's your address? And he gives it to him. And then he goes, is that an apartment or a house? And Samuel Jackson goes, that's a house. <laughs> he's proud and of it. Yeah. The pride in the way he says it because Loved he's it. got so much to prove yeah. as this criminal. And then Jackie Brown gets asked the same question at some point and she's just very like it's an apartment. Like she doesn't care. Yeah. You know There's what I mean? so many things like that in that movie. And I it's on Cinemax or whatever every night essentially and i wind up watching 45 minutes of it like every night yeah i get very excited every time i'm leaving lax and i walk through by yeah. that colored wall that she runs past at the one point i love when that scene between uh well pam greer's incredible forcer's incredible and then you'd think they would be huge stars off it but no they were just perfectly cast and you don't really yeah. want to see him in other things necessarily. Well, Pam, she had certainly had a resurgence yeah, after that. And Forster had, had had not as much of one, but did right. have one. But, but they're, when mean, they're sitting at the breakfast table, and they talk for like ten minutes, and they're, they're talking about getting older, and he's talking about, you know, my hair started falling out. You know, I did something. I went and got plugs. That's like yeah. a whole conversation that has nothing to do with the plot, but it tells you everything about them. And then she's talking about getting old, and she's like, ah, you know, my ass is getting big. And he goes, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And yeah. that's before big asses were in. And he's he put, like, nothing wrong with that. That got a huge laugh when I saw it in the oh, theater. In Missouri, it got a huge laugh. Yeah. and But people the enjoy great, a big ass. The great thing is, is that he doesn't say it in a pervy or flirty way. It's the perfect delivery. He says it like a dad would. Like, yeah. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know? When they kiss at the end before she leaves, I watched it recently with Heather, my girlfriend, and both of us were like misting up like I, yeah. I and i had never never had that reaction in the movie before it's a beautiful film You're like you desperately want them to be together and it's not even really a romance till that last second forster has also another great he was great through the whole movie but his other line delivery that's really fantastic is when uh they're in the car at the end 
he's in the car with with Sam Jackson at the end, and Sam Jackson goes, "You like the blue notes, whatever? I forget what band it is." Yeah, and uh, Robert Forster just goes, "They're pretty good." Yeah, <laughs> Delphonics <laughs> or Delphonics. Yeah, when the, I uh, when uh, I think Samuel Jackson was on Letterman, and Letterman, you you could always tell when Letterman loved or didn't like a movie. Mm-hmm. If he didn't like a movie, he either wouldn't talk about it or he'd blatantly make fun of it. And he's he will only he's talking about Jackie Brown to the extent where Samuel Jackson's almost like, can we talk about something else? <laughs> but he loves he's talking about you know Letterman loves Michael Keaton. He's going on and on about it. Oh yeah, Keaton, I forgot. Yeah, playing the same role as Out of Sight. Yeah, but he's talking uh, and he goes, he goes. They sent me a clip over Letterman's talking. He goes, I don't want to show that clip. Every scene in the movie is great, but I want to show my favorite scene. So I requested that they send over a different clip, and here it is. And they show this clip, and it's that clip where. Uh, Samuel Jackson sending the guy out to his car, and he goes, uh, all you got to do is push this button. You're going to hear a little oop, oop, oop. <laughs> yes. And the door's open, and he goes, don't fuck with my levels now. <laughs> you can play the stereo, but don't fuck with my levels yeah, now. Yeah, I got them just where I like them. And they cut back, and Letterman is, like, clapping and, like, laughing hysterically. <laughs> like, you could tell that he was just so passionate about the movie. Uh, well, and also the scene between uh, Chris... Uh, Tucker and Samuel Jackson. Oh yeah, the the scene where they're standing over the open trunk, I believe, is fully improv. I mean, it's like yeah, they're just it's so natural. Chris and Tucker, so, what a waste, man. He's got to come back. He is. I, I liked his Netflix special that just came out. Is I it th- good? I, I thought didn't it was watch funny. It. Okay, I'll watch. I thought it. it was funny. He curses again. Thank God, he right. got rid of that whole like I'm not going to curse thing. Right. It was funny. Yeah. All right, I'll it was watch. funny. Uh, well, Pat. This concludes our Jackie Brown podcast. Yeah, speaking what, of what sloth, are we doing? I'm about I'm about done here. Well, sloth isn't interesting to talk about. I mean, we checked it off, but frankly, if we talked about laziness, that's not interesting. Lust well, is interesting. The nice thing is, is we sort of half-assed our way through this podcast and talked about whatever we felt like and didn't <laughs> As commit we to always the topic, do. which is what sloth is. Yeah, in some ways, uh, you can follow us on Twitter. I'm at Joe DeRosa Comedy dot or at at Joe DeRosa Comedy. Excuse me. I am at the Patrick Walsh. Uh, you got anything to plug, Joseph? Oh, what am I plugging? Uh, I am going to be well. It, look, if you're in Scotland, I'll be in the at the Edinburgh uh, Fringe Festival throughout all of August of this year. Uh, I'll be in uh, Nashville in May for the Wild West Comedy Festival. Uh, curated. Is that still the Vince Vaughn thing? Yeah, produced by one. Awesome. Mr. Vince Vaughn and Peter Billingsley, Yep, I believe. Um, so I'll be down there in May, um, and I'll be, uh, like I said, I'll be uh, in, in Edinburgh in August. And if this comes out in time, I will be at the Moon Tower Comedy Festival in Austin, but I don't know when this is going to drop. All right. And uh, what else? Are you plugging anything? No, I don't really got nothing to plug. All right. Well. You've been listening to We'll See You in Hell, a presentation of the Fangoria Podcast Network, produced by Thomas DeFeo, executive produced by Ken Hanley of Fangoria Entertainment. For press opportunities, advertising inquiries, and information about We'll See You in Hell, contact Ken via his email. It's ken at fangoria.com. I know what I wanted to say. Uh, I looked on uh, iTunes randomly. I hadn't since like the first couple weeks of the podcast. We have tons and tons of great reviews. And thank you all for doing that. Thank you to those who interact with us on Twitter. We always love it. Even if we don't necessarily respond, we take your your suggestions and notes and, and stuff into consideration. Thank you very much. And you helped kind of stave off the people who were mad at Joe over his fucking... All right. Well, thank you, guys. We appreciate you, know, you fixing the ratings. Business. Yeah, the ratings are up. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Take care. <laughs>